He is on the Mount Rushmore of basketball reporting. Some would call him the Picasso of the industry. Or you know what, Rick? I think Aristotle might might fit him well. It is the great Rick Buecher. You see him all over the place. FS1, Fox Sports Radio, Buecher and Friends podcast. The list of ventures goes on. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio, and certainly Rick comes on with the guys at FSR all the time, so you hear him there. And Rick, for for so much of your career, you're the one that is shining light on athletes and telling stories. Now we're going to flip this around, and we're going to feature you and what you've done. So I appreciate you in a few minutes of your time and, and being a part of this. Let me start here. What's a personality trait from your time as a soccer player at Dartmouth mm-hmm. that foreshadowed the rise you would once or would later have in sports media? Wow. Well, first of all, can we just take the Picasso and the Aristotle <laughs> and all of that? I, I, I let you go there, but uh, I'd be happy to be the Tom Waits of there NBA, you go of NBA writers uh, or, or those who cover the NBA. Thanks for having me on, Brian. Mm-hmm. I, it's an interesting subject and it's an, it's an interesting question simply because my, I, I have two kids now and I see my, my kids getting ready to go to college, my daughter in particular, uh, and uh, have aspirations to play sports at the collegiate level. And I would say that the defining thing for me uh, that came out of playing soccer at Dartmouth was that I was uh, supremely frustrated with my career and what I thought I could do and what I thought I could be. And I never stopped chasing that. And in spite of the frustration. And so I had a vision of what I thought I could be and what I understood about being an athlete and uh, the ins and outs of trying to succeed and how you define success. And I would say there's still a part of me that because my, my collegiate career in a, in a way was wow. not what I wanted it to be, I've been trying to make up for that ever since wow. <laughs> someplace else. I mean, it is still like, my, my daughter's getting ready to go to, to college and she's got D3 offers and, but she wants to go, she wants to play D1 and she's got friends who have uh, been given rides and through a number of circumstances, her junior year uh, was, was disrupted by transferring schools, having a concussion. And so she doesn't have the tape and doesn't have the exposure that I think as an athlete that I, I think she's a D1 player. Yeah. But I, I, I said to her, I said, you know, it's better to go someplace and play because I sat my first two years. I was on varsity. I made it as a walk on, but I sat and I uh, it was just it was torture. And so, um, you know, I was a goal scorer in high school. I didn't score a single goal in my collegiate career. I ended up being a defensive mid, you know, you can shift it to a defensive midfielder. My last game against Princeton, I hit one from about 28 yards, upper right-hand corner, and the goalkeeper made the the save of his life in the final, in the final, like five minutes. And I, you know, I can, I, I have a vision of that. Like I've, my career is built on still trying to go back and score that goal. Like wow. that to me is like some, I'm not done. Um, and I think that that is also why I have been, uh, for whatever reason, I've been comfortable reinventing myself or, you know, transforming what I'm doing, looking at myself. Like I looked at myself as an, as an athlete. I, yes, I played soccer ended up covering basketball. Both were a passion of mine. Basketball was probably my first love. Um, and, and so, but I see myself as an athlete and understanding angles and all of the things that it, this, the sport itself. Yeah. There's certain nuances that you have to learn, but I think that they're all uh, relatable and transferable. 
And, and I feel the same with my professional career uh, as, a, as a journalist, as a writer, as a uh, TV analyst, um, is that it is all storytelling. It's all revealing something to uh, an audience that they may not have known otherwise, or just finding a way to shift their perspective. That's always my favorite when I read a story is when it, it gives me that, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Or it makes me look at the world in a slightly different way. That is my aspiration, even though we may be talking about basketball or whatever we may be talking about, um, that's the goal. And so in the same way, <laughs> in the same way that, you know, I, was trying to do something on the field or yeah. on the court or whatever, it, it's kind of, it's, it's the same deal. It's, it's producing that, that experience, that moment uh, that is singular and that makes people look at you or, or the situation in a slightly different way. I think they will, when it comes to you understanding the, the psychology behind why you do what you do. And the goal of this podcast was to, to sort of understand your thought process and what led you to where you are today. And so that's fascinating introspection on your part. When you were getting established in the business, hmm. what would you do as far as the drastic measures you would take to separate yourself from your peers, to stand hmm. out? Yeah. Uh, I, well, first of all, I wanted to, I, the, the thing that I hated the most, and this was coming up uh, early on when, um, when I covered some baseball, uh, covered some baseball, covered some major league baseball and covered some NFL and would walk into a locker room. And I overheard like a player to say, Oh, oh here comes the horde. Like here, here comes, here comes the, you know, here come the flies. And I was like, I'm never going to get anywhere if I'm just looked at as yeah. part of this crowd. And so when everybody would go to talk to the star after the game or the leading <sighs> scorer or whoever it was, I would go talk to the 12th man if it was wow. basketball. Or I would go talk to someone else. And there was uh, Ron Borges, who used to uh, write for the Boston Globe, once told me early on, um, and this was, this was actually, actually, I wasn't that early on. It was, it was about midway through my career. Um, he, uh, the, there was a play in the NFC uh, uh, conference championship where um, a play got blown up. 49ers ended up losing to the Giants. Play got blown up. And Roger Craig got stuffed and it was the pivotal game, pivotal uh, part of the game. Yeah. And everybody went to talk to Roger Craig. What happened? Everybody talked to the 49ers offensive lineman. What happened? Ron Borges went and talked to the defensive lineman or the linebacker that, that blew it up and said, what did you see? And uh, they said, we saw, the offensive linemen shift their shift their feet and it told them what was going to happen and that's why they were able to blow it up now everybody went one place and got the same story borges got that one little he got the key he like he he cracked the code in terms of why what happened happened and so i've always thought let me go where everybody isn't because whatever I'm going to get is going to be my story. And I'm going to be able to follow my train of thinking rather than trying to like squeeze a question in yeah. with everybody else's question. And what I found along the way is that when you went to talk to the people that normally nobody talked to, um, they were more than happy to talk to you. Like they, yeah. they, they appreciated the attention. They appreciated that, you were recognizing them. And what I could not have anticipated is that many of those 10th, 11th, 12th men when it came to basketball are the guys that wound up coaching and wow. going into front offices because they didn't make the millions of dollars that you know the other guys, they became scouts. Like they continued in the business where the superstars generally didn't have the need to continue to do sure. that. And so those relationships 
were developed early on. And this is what I've always looked at it. Like if I see somebody with talent or I see a player who's like got a certain IQ for the game and works hard. And I'm like, you know what? I, I want to get to know him more one because he can teach me and he can give me insight, but two, he's probably going to be around for a while. And that relationship is going to be valuable to me down the line. And he's going to appreciate that I was engaging him when nobody knew who he was. Um, I just had, I just did a podcast with Nick nurse and Nick, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick reminded me that 20, like some 20 years ago, we had lunch at, uh, at a hoop summit at Nike. I had completely forgotten about it. I'll be honest. Like when he mentioned it, I like, I could see in my mind's eye. Yeah. I remember being on the Nike campus and having lunch outside with, two people that I didn't really know. And Nick was one of them. Wow. Um, but I did not, I had not made that connection. And it's one of my like regrets that I knew Nick nurse way back then and didn't kind of like continue to follow his storyline, you know, coaching over in, in, in England and going through the G league and his whole line. But that generally has been how I've, develop the relationships and the connections that I have because they they started when these guys were not on the radar they were a long way from being a GM or a head coach or anybody of significance in 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 a position of power in the NBA there's no question when you approach them they feel appreciated you will never be forgotten as yeah. as you know yeah. they I feel like it's when you have a one-on-one, -on -one, you also get more revealing information from them than if you're in a scrum. You know all these 100%, 100%. things. Certainly, certainly observations that we see. Thanks to all of these relationships that you have developed, what's a big story that you were in the know about, you were on the cusp of breaking, that never happened? That it was about to blow up and it was about to be maybe some big transaction or something that was going to be zany in the NBA you were on the pulse of it and it ended up falling through a deal or something that, 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 re, that you recall that never made the news. It's, it's, it's hard for me to pinpoint one because there are so many gotcha. that happen where you get excited in the moment. And I guess I, my senses of that became dulled to a certain extent, whether it's sure. all-star weekend or it's leading up to the draft or, uh, or the trade deadline. Like I am, I always kind of laugh um, because I get to the other side of that event and you have the weeks leading up to it. And my notebook will be full of <laughs> like these different potential scenarios um, especially like all, all star weekend. Cause when, especially when it was like, that was always the lead up to the trade deadline. Right. And so there was so much conversation that would go on there and I would get to Monday and I would look at my notebook or notebooks. They'd be full of stuff. And like the vast majority of it came and went and none of it happened. And, and, and I would like, like, what the hell did I do this weekend? Like I, I gathered all of this information and, ultimately, you know, the vast majority of it didn't, did not, did not happen. Now, there are times where when you hear about conversation, like now the way it works is you'll hear it bubble up early on. And generally it doesn't go away. It'll go away, but it doesn't disappear. Um, it, it, it's going to come back in some form. Uh, so I like, I don't know. I heard John Collins was on the trading block like a year ago, um, which seemed a little crazy at the time, but I had heard that. I just heard it again. Like, and so there's, there's like, okay, so there's something going on there where that's not quite the fit. And maybe ultimately he doesn't get traded. Maybe they make some other moves, but that's where, that's where that value of things, like you're saying this, you know, the big deal that didn't happen. Um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of those, but generally mm -hmm. they're like threads from those that do happen or something sure. does happen as a result of that. So I've never looked at it like this big thing. 
uh, was on the cusp of happening. I mean, the first thing I thought of when you said that was Chris Webber telling me at the beginning of his rookie year with the Warriors that he was not planning on staying beyond that year. It's, yeah. And they had just traded, you know, they just mortgaged their future for him. And he said, but you can't tell anybody or you can't write it. And I was like, I have to sit on this the entire, <laughs> like what you didn't do me a favor, dude. Like, yeah. what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah. And so, you know, it was a couple of days later where I went to him and I said, look, I'll, I'll keep a lid on this until it becomes apparent that something's wrong. And then I have to write, sure. like, I have to explain like what's going on. And, and he was, he was cool with that. Um, and so it was like two and a half weeks later, things started to blow up and I ended up writing a story, but, um, you know, my, I was thinking that I'm going to date myself. There was, um, you met him at the airport, didn't you, Chris? I met him at the airport, <laughs> me and a real estate agent. Yeah. I remember him, hearing about that. Yeah. Met him when he, when he came in and, and again, like, this is the challenge of covering any sport, I think today is that uh, access is, is number one, sure. you know, just, um, I mean, Kobe Bryant at the Long Beach State, I saw him in his first summer league game and we could just walk around like media, whatever. Like it was just, it was just like a, a, you know, it was like a, 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 a street fair. Mm -hmm. you, know, you could just, you could sit where you wanted. You could walk where you wanted. Like I walked into the locker room after like just, Game's over, players go in. Five minutes later, I, I walk in, there's Kobe, there's the team, walk out with him. You could walk to the car. Like there was, the, the security level was non-existent. And so the freedom to be able to uh, to talk to guys and and yeah. just create relationships is is a lot different than today. And this is what I really struggle with and why you know, being a news, I don't consider myself a news breaker per se ever, you know, I, I, I still hear things and sure. try to try to share them. Um, but I, I, what I struggle with is that um, it's become such a challenge to have relationships where you're going to beat everybody else by, you know, five minutes, getting it out online or whatever that, um, I feel like the relationship between the media and the people that we cover has been compromised. Sure. That there's too much, you know, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. And that, that, and which is always, I mean, there's always been the, you got to build a relationship and, you know, you got to have a lot of conversations where the notebook is closed or the microphone's off or the recorder, like mm -hmm. there's, there's negotiation that goes on. Um, I mean, it's a little bit like me with, with Chris Weber, like yeah. telling me and then saying, you can't write it. And I'm like, okay, but I like, I, I got to do my job. You know, I appreciate that you trust me to tell me this and I don't want to, uh, you know, damage the relationship because that's going to be very valuable, but I still have a job to do. And quite honestly, if C Web, if it was his fault or if, like whatever it is, I got to be able to say that too i got to be able to write the truth and i feel as if there's a lot less of that today like you you can tell when somebody breaks a story like the way they frame it yeah they're doing them a favor like they're getting wow. the information because they're going to tell it the way the per the source wants it told and and i can't tell you the number of things that i've you know, have been brought to me, especially when I was at, at, at ESPN and I had that, the more of a label of, of, you know, a newsbreaker where I, they'd say, Hey, like, I got this for you, you know, but, and they kind of like, they tell you in a way you could tell them you, they wanted you to tell it in a certain way. Oh, geez. And I'd go, and I'd have to say, look, appreciate it. This is what I will say, or I got to make a couple more calls because I need to give the other side, right? And um, sometimes they, they're like, uh, you know, they would pass on it or they'd give it to somebody else. So they'd, you know, they'd go, they'd go someplace else. They'd do something else. 
And so I, you know, technically was losing a scoop. Um, but I just felt it was like, if I, if I, if I am prey to um, just being dictated how they want the story delivered instead of me having my autonomy and saying, okay, this is how, what, this is what I think the truth is. This is what I see the picture as then I was not only undermining my own integrity, sure. but I was in undermining the integrity of the entire media because now it becomes a game, right? Where they just forum shop. Let me find the biggest voice that's willing to do or tell the story the way I want it told. And then they're going to get the scoop. And, and I just, I don't know. There's just a part of me. I, I mean, as it's going be going all the way back to the Dartmouth soccer thing. Where it's like, yeah. you know what? I, 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 I'm not going to, um, I'm, I'm going to try to do this the way I think it needs to be done. Um, and I'm not going to set my standard. I'm going to define success in a different way. Like I got to be okay with how I get there. It's not get there by any means. Yeah. And um, so, you know, maybe it's cost me, uh, but I, I don't think it's cost me in the big picture. Like I can sleep at night. I, I can walk away from my career whenever it ends and go, yeah, you know what? I, I did it the way I, I, I thought it should be done. Um, and, and again, I, let's like, I don't even know if I, if, if that sounds like criticism of people that are doing it now, like I'm in a different place. Like if I was coming up now, maybe, maybe I could find a way to rationalize why this is just the way it is. Like if you're going to do it, this is the compromise you have to make in order to get the job done and getting the information out there is worth the compromise. I'm just glad I never had to face that. Never had to face that choice to make my, uh, to make it my livelihood. You've got standards that you uphold and you didn't get into the business to be a PR guy. And I think that when you have uh, those sort of tendencies, maybe it comes across like you were saying in ways in which you wouldn't go as far as presenting information, breaking news. That's not the way you do business. And that's why your brand is what it is and, and why a lot of people gravitate towards you. One of my final questions for you, and Rick Bucher is joining us, I'm Brian Fenley. And one of your recent podcasts, you brought up the impact that Seku Smith has had on your life and in your relationship with him. How do you want to use his spirit and keep it in your life forever, even though he's gone? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's affirmation of uh, everything that we've just been talking about. Yeah. Because um, Seku is one of those guys who love the job, who made it clear that he loved the job. He's been doing it and he did it as long as, as, as I've been doing it. We kind of came in you know, pretty much at the same time and, um, and, and I always like, <laughs> I saw guys when I came in who were embittered. Like, I think we know that the, 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 the salty old sports writers who are just, yeah. oh yeah. You know, and, and I kind of get it because we all are gravitate to wanting to work in sports or cover sports because we love the story, right? We love the, uh, the magic of sports and what can happen when people come together and try to accomplish something and they, they make miracles happen, right? That's, that's, what, it, that's mm -hmm. what attracts us. And then we cover the sport and we see underneath like all the politics and the greed and the egos and all of that. And, and mm -hmm. it, it kind of immediately takes the shine off of the thing that attracted you to it to in the first place. Seku never lost that. Like he never lost that, that love that we get to do this for a living and the love of, of sport and how it brings people together uh, to create that collective magic. And then the fact that he was a father and a husband and, you know, as I've experienced it was really easy for me when I was single before I was married. Like I could just focus on the job and that was, and I loved it. I'd travel wherever, do whatever, 
when do I need to make a phone call? I, I, I love that freedom. The challenge of then doing the job um, and having kids and being a husband and, you know, and having a healthy balance and still loving the job and still putting as much as I possibly can into the job. Like Seku did all of that. And then to see how that resonated with people, because I, I can't name a single story that Seku, I'm sure he broke stories, but that's not what he was like that's not what people remember about him. It's uh, the 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 spirit with which he did the job and he lived his life, and that uh, to see everybody recognizing that and and mourning that that spirit has been snuffed from us. That to me is the uh, the motivation and the inspiration. Um, to continue to do it where like help the next person coming up. I mean, I get a lot of calls and a lot of people reaching out. How do I, how do I get to do what you, you know, do? And I, I don't know if that path even exists anymore, but uh, I, you know, I, I want to help. I want to help. And, and in large part, because it's what Seku would have done, you know? And so, um, yeah, I'm glad you asked the question. Cause yeah. like, you know, we, we, we saw more of each other when we were beat writers and we would see each other now and then. So I can't say we were like particularly close, sure. but we knew each other a long time and we were in the business and he was just one of those guys that I was just always happy to see and was an affirmation of like doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So well said, Rick. And I want to finish off by asking and, and bringing up a book that you're a part of with Brian Grant yeah. and the, the journey that he's been on and you helping write this, I'd love to finish with sort of your thoughts on what it was like putting that together and when people can get it, where they can get it and why it's going to be a, a really cool read for, for basketball fans everywhere. First of all, I'm convinced that I'm a glutton for punishment when it comes to uh, to, to writing biographies or helping guys <laughs> write their memoirs because my first book was with Yao Ming. Okay. Who I didn't even know how much uh, English he could speak when we first started the project, and he had an interpreter, Colin Pl Colin Pine. And the first time we worked on the book, uh, we sat down and Colin translated everything like. And I could tell by the way he was trans translating it that this was not me asking questions of Yao and getting Yao's response. This was me asking questions of Colin and getting Colin's response based on what he thought Yao should be saying. Oh my goodness. Um, and so I was like, this is not going to work. And then we wound up meeting in Hong Kong and Yao came to my hotel room and um, this is the first time like, can we do it without an interpreter? And he had just taken an elbow to the forehead and um, and he pointed to it and said, looks like the Mercedes Benz symbol. And I was like, you know what? This is gonna work. We're, yes. we're gonna, I gotta figure out like how to write this because what the, the English, I didn't want it, wanted, didn't want him to sound like a simpleton because his yeah. English was simple. Sure. So I had to figure out like, okay, he doesn't know this word now, but he's going to know it in six months. Mm -hmm. So I can use it in trying to relay his English or amplify his English. Brian Grant, uh, young onset Parkinson's. One of the first things it affects is your memory. And it also uh, is uh, um, creates depression, which people dealing with depression often isolate and connect them and disconnect from from the world. So I'm basically trying to write a book with a guy who can't remember everything and uh, disappears for weeks at a time. That, that's that's where we started. And but um, I knew I don't know I, I I'm a sucker for the underdogs. Again, might come from you know being a walk on or whatever. I mean, I, I, all roads lead back to that experience. Yeah. Um, there's something about um, how people felt about Brian as a player 
in spite of the fact that he wasn't an all-star, he wasn't like um, a, a, a premier player. He didn't have that. But if you talk to people in Portland about how they felt about him or Sacramento or Miami, and the fact that he, that, that like Pat Riley, he's, he's a Pat Riley guy, like, you know, Pat, Pat gave him uh, at one point when he, when he traded him to uh, LA to the Lakers, he gave him a forever card. Oh. And whenever you need me, you pull your forever card. I will be there for you. And, uh, and Pat has held true to that. And knowing Pat Riley as I do, when you've earned his loyalty, it means that you are some kind of special guy to, to have him devote himself to you like that. So for all those reasons, and then, you know, just seeing somebody, I read Michael J. Fox's uh, Lucky Man. Mm -hmm. And I thought, here's an actor who got Parkinson's and how it affects him. But for an athlete and for an athlete like Brian, where his physical supremacy is at the heart of his, of who he is and, and, and who he thinks he is and, uh, and his personality, his, his effervescence. Those are the two things that physical being and that personality are the things that Parkinson's attacks and starts to rob you of day by day. And to have somebody like Brian who played through all kinds of injuries and just had the mindset, I can work my way through anything. You know, I can get a surgery or I can work harder or I can, you know, I can take a pain relief. I can, something sure. can fix the problem, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Now facing an opponent, there is no fixing it. There is no cure. And it's going to rob you of the things that are at the heart of who you see yourself as. Sure. How do you fight that battle? Wow. Like, how do you live your life in a way? And, you know, he, he f has always, he's found the same solution and he's doing it now, which is I'm going to think of others. I'm not going to think about what I'm losing. I'm going to think about what I can give to someone else. And he did it as a player when he was going through some of the, I mean, read the book because yeah, like he is honest about, he, he had uh, his soon to be wife and another woman pregnant at the same time wow. while playing in Portland, playing with a torn rotator cuff. And he couldn't tell anybody about either thing. So um, he had these secrets and, uh, and, and his outlet was he started working with terminally, uh, uh, terminally uh, diseased kids. Wow. Um, and just hang and just going to see them, like not doing it for publicity or any of that. Yeah. And the relief of being in their world for a moment, feeling their pain or, you know, their challenges or their, um, you know, their, the, the, bre the potential brevity of their life, like gave him the escape from all of the stuff that he was going through. Wow. Um, and he's sort of taken the same approach with Parkinson's. Like, what can I do for other people who have Parkinson's? How can I inspire them? What can I give them that I've learned that will make their lives better? So I don't think about what I'm, I no longer have, or I'm afraid of losing. And I just, I, I found it incredibly inspiring to be given the, the, uh, the trust to step inside that experience and, and listen uh, to what it's like and how you fight that fight. And again, same kind of as Seku, you know, doing the next right thing because it's the right thing to do. Rick Buecher, that's why he's one of the best. Just breaking it down like that, no better person to canvas a guy like Brian Grant. And you see selflessness from Brian Grant, you see it from Rick Buecher, and it goes all the way back to those days when he was on the bench <laughs> at Dartmouth <laughs> as a soccer player. Rick, thank you so much. I'm Brian Finley. It has been an honor. I know your time is very valuable. 
And I know a lot of people are going to love this conversation. Really, really appreciate you. My pleasure, Brian. Thanks for having me.